Welcome uh, back, everyone. Uh, I have the pleasure and the privilege uh, to announce our next uh, speaker, uh, Richard Baldwin, is sitting over there. Uh, he's the director of CEPR, the Center for, for Economic Policy Research in London. He is uh, the founder and editor-in-chief of Vox EU, a very influential and popular blog in economics that I highly recommend to those who, have not, who are not uh, already daily readers. So it's voxeu.org. And he is an author of a uh, recent book that fits very well into the theme of our conference, The Great Convergence, Information Technology, and the New Globalization. Ricardo features actually quite prominently in here. Uh, and uh, uh, what the book also does, it, it's, uh, it gives a, an outlook of uh, how to think about the economy that is in the making and uh, what trade economists like many of us here can contribute to this. I don't want to steal any of the precious time we have. I'm sure we're going to see a very entertaining and insightful uh, talk by Richard Baldwin. Please join me in, giving, in welcoming him and giving him a hand of applause. Thank you. Thank you for that. Well, thank you, Gabriel, for those kind words. Um, I'll steal a little bit of my own time to talk about my personal relationship with Ricardo, which was mentioned a bit this morning. Uh, I was taught by the man, my father, who was taught by the man, Gottfried Hobler, who brought Ricardo into the modern era. And uh, most of you probably learned about opportunity cost at university. That was the parenting plan in my family. We had a very different way. My mother was doing her PhD. She went my father. Jean Grossman's my brother-in-law. She married my sister, who also has a PhD in economics. Paul Krugman was advisor. We could keep going on and on. So I feel like I have a connection to trade and, and Ricardo. Now, the title that was assigned to me today is uh, 200 years after Ricardo, what is the outlook for economic globalization? Now, the word outlook tips you off that we're going to be talking about the future which basically means I'm going to be making it up. Nobody knows the future. And what I hope to do is to provide some insights that may help you all think through the future of globalization. I think that's a very important thing. I think globalization will change, is changing very quickly, and we're not ready for it. Uh, so what I'm going to do is propose a broader narrative of thinking about globalization in the next 30 minutes and hope that you can use it to think through what the future might bring. Now, uh, as, as, uh, just, just to warn you, they call this a keynote, which means it's less scientific and less serious than the other ones, but I will have much better slides, so. <laughs> okay. Now, I'll also let you ponder whether that's a sunrise or a sunset uh, on globalization, and uh, by the end of, of, of the talk, hopefully you'll, you'll figure out which one I, th I think it is. Let me start um, with Ricardo and the first big change in globalization. So Ricardo was the right idea at the right time. And what this graph shows is world GDP shares going all the way back to the year 1000. This is Angus Madison data, uh, completely made up, but at least he made it up. <coughs> Now, it tracks two groups of countries on a global scale, India and China and the G7 country. So India and China back in the year 1000 had 51% of world GDP because they had 51% of the population. And back in the year 1000, almost everybody was quite poor, not very much far for above the subsistence level. There were a few big cities, but, but those, most people lived at the starvation. The G7 back then only had 7% of the world's population, and thus about 7. The next 18 centuries, not very much changed. There was uh, some growth in the G7 share, tripled up to 22% by 1820. But you can see here that something dramatic happened to the world economy in around 1820. Kevin O'Rourke and, and Jeff Williamson say that's when modern globalization, what I'll call gl old globalization, started. And you can see it had a dramatic impact on the world economic geography. 
the G7 share of global GDP went from a fifth up to two thirds in 170 years, and India and China's crashed. That was what Ricardo was helping us understand. Up until this moment, as, as we heard this morning, trade was really a win lose kind of thing. It was basically a way of accumulating gold to go and steal somebody else's land. And here, the nature of value shifted to industry, and what you really wanted was markets, not land. And Ricardo helped us understand that whole thing. So he had his moment, the right idea at the right time. This is Ricardo's bold thought experiment. I told you better slides, right? So, now Ricardo was simplifying to understand. He was extreme to be extremely clear. He has three key premises. Nations are the correct unit of analysis, so comparative advantage is a national thing. Goods are the only thing crossing borders, and lower trade costs is what's driving globalization. And to this day, that is the dominant paradigm of how we think about, that's our mindsets, our narratives, our models. Basically, nations have predefined comparative advantage. Globalization means that they can exploit those comparative advantage by sending goods to each other. Ricardo's abstraction worked really, really well for 170 years. Trade costs came down and trade volumes went up. But of course, as, as we all know historically, this old globalization, this Ricardian globalization, was really like a Hollywood three-act movie. The first act was a setup where you introduced the hero before World War I, from 1820 down to 1914, the trade costs fell radically and global uh, trade volumes rose. Then, as in all good Hollywood movies, there's a challenge to the hero. World War I, the Great Depression, World War II, we did not know if globalization was gonna make it, but as in all Hollywood movies, it had a happy ending, the triumph after the war, trade costs continue falling, trade volumes continue rising. That's how we got to love Ricardo so much. It helped us organize our thinking with a very simple model of why globalization, more or less, was good for the world for 170 years. But globalization changed around 1990. So here's the same chart from 1,000 up to about 2012. And you notice between 1993 and now, the G7's share fell from two-thirds to under half. It is back down to where it was in 1900. Now, the reason I wrote my book, and I'm giving this talk today, is most of us are thinking through the red dots with the mindsets which were developed to understand the green dots. And I humbly submit to you that this may be missing a few things. So, think about globalization as arbitrage. Deep down, that's all it is. And Ricardo was about arbitrage in goods. But I'd like to suggest that it's useful and instructive, especially when thinking about the future, to also consider arbitrage in know-how, that's I think what's been going on the last two decades, and labor, which I think is what's gonna happen in the next five to 10 years. Better slides, right? No, you gotta, that took me a long time to do that. Hope you appreciate that. Okay, now think of three costs constraining globalization as arbitrage. Trade costs, the cost of moving goods. Communication costs, which is the cost of moving ideas. And face-to-face -face costs, which is the cost of moving people. Now, I'm going to talk about this broader narrative of globalization by strapping it on the back of a quick trot through 200 years of globalization. So I will be skipping a few details. We'll go about uh, 20 years every five seconds. So, uh, but you can watch the slides and you can read the book. The steam revolution in Pax Britannica lowered the cost of moving goods around 1820, uh, somewhere around there. This made high volume trade feasible, comparative advantage made it profitable, and globalization as arbitrage of goods begins. But it's important to note that the cost of moving goods fell radically more than the cost of moving ideas or people, at least by today's standards. Globalization's first unbundling, as I like to call it, or old globalization, meant the geographic separation of production and consumption. 
So when all the costs were high before, this is what the world economy looked like. Almost the entire world economy was village-level autarkic, the same almost everywhere. People were tied to the land because that's what people did. And if they needed anything to be produced, it had to be produced within walking distance, unless you were a priest or a prince or a pirate or some extraordinarily rich person. Everything was either made by yourself or made very nearby. So production and consumption were bundled. Now, what the lowering trade costs did was allow production and consumption to unbundle. And since countries had very different comparative advantage, production started to cluster. This is the Ricardian st story. People focused on doing what they do best and importing the rest. High volumes of trade rose. The only thing that's really crossing borders is goods. And globalization depends upon the pace at which the cost of goods falls. But this had another very important effect. To save on communication cost, production micro-clustered into factories. And this spurred innovation, but the know-how stayed local, so we got the great divergence. So think about this over here. When trade costs are high and the world is small, production facilities are small and dispersed. That meant it wasn't very worth much to innovate because you were only producing for a few dozen families. Moreover, it was expensive to innovate because there was not many other people to think about the same problems. When you lowered the cost of moving goods, you could supply to the entire world, and industry adopted scale-intensive, enormous activities, which were complex. To organize that complexity, they micro-clustered it within countries, within industrial districts and factories, and that sparked the bonfire of innovation. Every cost savings was really worth something when you were selling to the world market. Moreover, we had lots of people thinking about the same innovation so it could get going. And that sparked the industrial revolution and the growth takeoff. But since it was hard to move ideas, complex ideas, that knowledge stayed local. And we got the great divergence as innovation and knowledge built up in the G7, but did not spread. Now, we come up to 1990. Information and Communication Revolution, ICT, lowered the cost of moving ideas, and globalization as knowledge arbitrage begins. So now we have the cost of moving goods lower, and the cost of moving ideas lower, and that starts to transform the world. And if you take nothing away from this talk, I would like you to think about globalization much more as know-how crossing borders, and perhaps a little less about goods crossing borders. Now, this is what I mean. ICT made offshoring feasible, and vast wage differences made it profitable. So globalization's second unbundling, which is the unbundling of the factories, unbundling of the microclusters, started, and we got the great convergence. So here's the story. Before, it was microclustered, and there was lots of innovation, but it stayed in the G7 countries. Now over here, ICT made it possible to organize complex activities at great distance. So many of the things that were done in a single factory weren't appropriate to the factor costs, so the companies unbundled the production process and moved some stages abroad. That's what this is, all coordinated by ITC. Of course, everybody's noticed that. Offshoring, foreign direct investment, fragmentation, industrialization of the developing countries. But you're focusing on the wrong thing there. What really changed was that the light bulbs are now crossing borders. In essence, before this, we kind of talked about German technology or American technology, and that's what the Ricardian abstraction tells us to do. After this, we found out that it wasn't German technology, it belonged to Mercedes or it belonged to Ford. And Mercedes could take their technology, firm-specific technology, and combine it with Polish labor abroad, thereby changing Poland's comparative advantage. In essence, that denationalized comparative advantage. As the boundaries of technology became more firm-related and less national-related. And in fact, even today, we talk about American car technology. The America doesn't own any car technology. The companies do. Moreover, since it's a non-rival good, they don't have to choose where to put it. They spread it. So now Ford is using this technology in America and in Mexico and in China. 
in a way that's validated complex knowledge in the market enormously, and also knowledge in people's heads. So one way to think about this is globalization is knowledge arbitrage, means comparative advantage is denationalized, so it's a little bit like Ricardo in a reverse. Instead of taking the technology as given and allowing trade to let countries arbitrage the differences, we now have pipelines that are moving the technology. Those pipelines are sometimes called global value chains. So what we have here is a situation where we have these headquarter economies, G7, which had high know-how to labor ratios and therefore high wages, and factory economies which had low know-how to labor ratios and therefore low wages. And before, the only way to arbitrage that was by sticking the labor into a good and then exporting the good. With this global value chain revolution and the ICT that made it possible, companies started moving the know-how abroad and combining it with low-cost labor. That completely transformed the world of manufacturing. It created, for the first time, the combination of high-tech, low wages. And that's why manufacturing shifted so rapidly in just two decades uh, from the G7 to a handful of developing countries. But it only went to the countries who got a pipeline. It did not spread generally. This wasn't kind of a burst of caring and sharing where the G7 sort of helped the developing countries produce stuff. It was firm-specific technology taken to a specific factory to produce specific things, and the company tried to prevent it from spreading. So the impact was very, very concentrated, but it completely changed the nature of manufacturing. Now, that manufacturing revolution in countries like China and Poland and Mexico sparked rapid income growth in those countries, also included India. And since that was about half the world's population, rapid income growth sparked the commodity super cycle. So some of the emerging markets did it because they were getting know-how that they couldn't get before. And other ones did it because it sparked the commodity super cycle and they got a enormous terms of trade gain. And a few people like Norway got lucky because they were rich before and then they had the terms of trade gain, Australia as well. So this is how I'd like you to think a little more broadly about globalization and what's been happening recently, the last, say, two decades, since 1990, is it's not just goods crossing borders, but know-how crossing borders within GVC boundaries. Okay, you don't, you like this one? No? Okay. So this, I'm gonna talk now about how this perhaps explains anti-globalization in many rich countries. And before I start, let me say, globalization's anti-backlash is not global. You go to the emerging markets, they love globalization. If you even look at the Pew surveys, it, the emerging markets, most of the people say globalization helps raise wages. And in the rich countries, it says it lower, majority says it lower wages. So this is something that's not global. And it makes perfect sense when you think about the nature of things crossing borders changed. I, maybe this analogy will, will work. Think about the old globalization as two football teams sitting down to exchange players. Now, if the exchange actually happens, both teams are better off because maybe you had an extra goalie and they, they have a, a, an extra forward. So everybody's better off if it happens. That's the old globalization. That's the Ricardian paradigm. Now, the next situation is where the trainer of the better team goes to the pitch of the worst team on the weekends and trains them up. Now, this has different implications. It definitely would be good for the trainer, which in this case are the large corporations doing the outsourcing. And it most definitely will lay, raise the level of the game. Manufacturing worldwide becomes more competitive. But it's not absolutely sure that it's better for the pre team who previously had a monopoly on the knowledge of their coach. So, the new globalization leads to backlash, in my opinion, in the rich countries because it operates with a finer degree of resolution. It's not sectors and skill groups anymore. So what do I mean by that? Think about the old globalization and the competition between US cars and Japanese cars in the 1980s, 70s and 80s. Japan pushed out the American, pushed down the American automakers during that time in a, in a way that was very disruptive. But Japanese competition showed up in America in the form of a car, which was low price for how good it was. And so what we essentially had there was a competition between Team Japan and Team US in the auto industry. 
So the auto industry was hurt. Everybody in the auto industry understood what was going on, and they all sunk or fell together. And as it happened, because of comparative advantage, the sectors which were unskill intensive are the ones who got hurt the most. So we started thinking about globalization's impact as sectors and skill groups. In fact, almost all of our policies, and even our social institutions like labor unions, are designed assuming that globalization will hit the economy at, at sector and skill level. We talked about sunrise sectors and sunset sectors. We talked about upskilling the workforce as a way of protecting against globalization. And I would suggest that that's not the way it works anymore. Because the company can take the technology to do a particular stage and move it from Detroit to Mexico very suddenly, globalization is reaching inside the factory and helping some stages and hurting other stages. And it's not necessarily associated with skill. It could be high, some high-skilled, some low-skilled, and people are losing their job, not really understanding it, because we keep telling them that this new globalization is like the 60s, 70s, and 80s. It just it takes a while. You'll have to move into a sunrise sector, and you'll be OK. More, moreover, uh, it's not skill groups anymore, because the globalization can even reach into occupations and put individuals into competition with other individuals abroad in a way that was never possible before. So it seems more individual. The second is it broke G7 labor's monopoly on G7 technology. And that caused some problems, some job losses, dis disruptions, wage effects. But above all, it just didn't seem fair. If you're working for Ford and they took your technology, your job that you and your father had, moved it down to Mexico, and employed somebody who was earning a tenth of what you were, that just seemed unfair. That's not the way globalization was supposed to be. You can understand competition, but this seems to be social dumping, wage undermining very directly, and it's your own company doing it. Moreover, the, the divisive thing about it is that if they outsource some sectors, that makes the whole thing more efficient. So offshoring some stages make the other stages more effective. So the unions don't know how to react to that. Some are helped, some are hurt. So these two things, I believe, make, have explain some of the economic anxiety, fragility, and disenfranchisement because the new globalization is more sudden. It's more sudden because it's driven forward by ICT. Not tariff cuts, not better te te transportation technology. It's driven forward by things that double in capacity every year or, y or two. It's more individual because the competition can reach right inside factories and offices and put individuals into competition with foreigners in a way that was never possible before when foreign competition showed up at home in the form of a good. It's more unpredictable because we just don't really know why all this stuff was bundled together. You, you, all the people in universities and corporations, you put departments together fit, sitting physically because that seems to work, but you don't have a study as to what will happen if the cost of, of unbundling that had. And lastly, it's more uncontrollable because although governments are good at, cross, at controlling goods and people crossing borders, they are not good at controlling know-how crossing borders, which is what's driving this entire thing. Now, if you continue to think that globalization is mostly about goods crossing borders, and you, like Donald Trump, think globalization is going a little too fast, your natural conclusion is to slow down how goods cross borders. But if what's really going on is American know-how is moving abroad to produce things, that will have very unintended consequences. But the end of this whole thing is no matter what job or skill you have, you really can't be sure your job is next. And I think that's created a harmonic of disenfranchisement that has not been addressed, especially in the US. Couple points on that. One, in the 60s, 70s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, globalization advanced, but the entire welfare state, even in the United States, was advancing at the same time. The great society was advanced at this time. So there were policies to help the winners and losers while globalization was advancing. Where in the last two or three decades, the social welfare system has been retracted as globalization has, has been advancing. The same thing is true in England. And I think that's one of the reasons why those two countries are having a particular problem. They just don't have the right domestic policies to do it. Okay, and I should have said, uh, I've been talking globalization that this is a scary thing. 
Uh, but that's, I, I read a book on public speaking, and they told me you should scare your audience because that way they pay attention. <laughs> Are you scared? Well, wait, just wait later. You'll be even more scared. But in any case, what, what I should say is that globalization is always more opportunities for your most competitive citizens and companies and more competition for your least competitive citizens and companies. And I've been talking about the competition side. This second unbundling has allowed people like us in this audience who have great deal of knowledge to leverage our knowledge on a bigger market. And so we have all prospered from it. So this second unbundling has created opportunities for many, many people. I'm not trying to say it's bad, but it's affecting the domestic economies in a different way, and it's affecting the rich and the poor countries in different ways. Okay, so here, future globalization. This is the, uh, the other reason why uh, future globalization is six and a half minutes. Okay, so I'm, I'm quite worried that we're not ready for the next globalization, which I don't think will be like the first unbundling or the second unbundling. But as you can see, I'm, I'm using the future tense here, which again means I'm making it up. And uh, I have this bad habit of actually sounding like I believe everything I say. So from here on, I'm just making it up. I know I'm just making it up. And what I want you to do is not write down anything I say, but write down how I'm thinking about the problems with this broader narrative, and maybe it will help you think through, which you will have to do. Okay, so you know, you know the, the Jaws? We're going to need a bigger boat. Has anybody seen the movie Jaws? No? Yes, okay, well, I won't explain it. I don't have time for that. It's a good movie, though. Okay, so what happens when the third constraint on globalization is arbitrage is relaxed? And I'm not talking about easier travel, although that would be very nice. Uh, I'm talking rather communication technology that creates close substitutes for being there. In particular, the doubling of communication capacities every 12 to 18 months, telepresence, to, which will allow brain services, telerobotics, which will allow trade and manual services, virtual reality, and above all, machine translation, which will eliminate the language barrier. Now, the idea is that we're going to be in a world where the cost of moving goods, ideas, and labor services are possible. So the third unbundling is when laborers and labor services are unbundled. So what you can think about that is, think of advanced communication technology as opening a new pipeline for globalization as arbitrage of labor services. So here we have our headquarter economies with high labor to know-how uh, know to labor ratios and high wages, and factory economies who still have low know-how to labor ratios. And this pipe will allow the laborers to provide labor services in rich countries without actually being there. Now what that means is the two-thirds of the economy, the service sector, who has hereto always been protected from globalization and automation, will very soon find this up close and personal. One way to think about it is the service sector has been protected by, you know, just to make up numbers of 500% tariff, and that tariff's going to go down to, I don't know, 50 or 20 in the next three to five years as communication capacity doubles and it becomes possible. If you don't believe it, look around. Think about the gig economy, which is now mostly national. Think about when foreign workers can participate in the gig economy, when, it, when they have technologies that makes it seem that you're almost there. Okay, so the next globalization is coming faster than you think. What happened to goods sector in the last two decades may be happening to the service sector in the next five to ten years, but because it's communication technology we're talking about, it can move very, very fast. I think we're misthinking it because we have this walking distance brain, and this is exponential growth. So let me just give you a couple examples of that. Um, if you take a piece of paper, a long piece of paper, and fold it in half, how many times would I have to repeatedly fold it to get that stack of paper up to the height of a cigarette? The answer is 10. And if I fold it another six times, it's the height of Shaq O'Neal. And if I fold it another 10 times, it's the height of Mount Everest, which, of course, is just exponential growth. Or put it this way, this thing, the iPhone 6, is more powerful, has more processing speed than the computer that guided Apollo 11 to the moon. Do you know by how much more? 100, 1,000, million? The answer is 120 million times more. Now here's the kicker. The iPhone 7 has 140% times more processing power. 
So things that seem crazy now, like machine translation, in two or three years will be absolutely possible. And all you have to do is go back and think what this thing was five years ago. It was a music player with a phone that didn't work very well and had a bad battery. Now it's part of your life. It's join your communities. You've probably all created rules to control this thing. That's how this virtual presence or this remote reality, this remote, remote intelligence will come in and affect the service sector. It's not like a revolution, it's not like a science fiction movie. It'll be like how we adopted this. One convenience at a time, five years later, we'll look back and go, how did we get along without all, without all that uh, RI and AI? So I think many of us are in the five stages of global grief, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. And most of us, I think, are in the denial stage. I won't ask for hands how many of you think uh, technology will affect your job, but uh, you should all raise your hands because the one thing that these things are good at is sophisticated pattern recognitions based on experience. So if anything in your job is based on sophisticated pattern recognition based on experience, that bit of your job will be toast in three to five years. Okay, so think about the gig economy with service providers in low-wage nations. Think remote intelligence, not artificial intelligence. What the big thing is you read about on the news all the time is these robots taking over human jobs driven by AI. But realize this communication technology will allow humans to run those robots remotely. Uh, Low-wage people providing coffee and, and uh, check-in services, all sorts of things, remote intelligence, not just artificial intelligence. Okay, where's I? This was my prof. Sorry? Gig economy. So that's uh, in, in the United States and other places. So people quit companies and they start their own micro companies and they'll, they'll do project specific work for a particular amount of money. That's called the gig economy. So a gig is a, a, a slang word for a musical engagement one at a time. So you don't have formal, you just break it all up. So that's the idea. Okay, so Ricardo, the next globalization. The next globalization, in my view, will be more like the old globalization since the sources of comparative advantage um, will stay put. You do not need to move massive amounts of information in order to get Filipinos to provide check-in services to hotels in Rome or to get Kenyan maids to drive telerobots who make uh, hotel beds in Berlin. You don't need something sophisticated. This is not a game for big companies. It's micro to micro. It'll look a lot more like Uber. It will be highly disruptive in the rich nations because in essence, the service sector was protected from automation by the unique human cognitive capacities. It used to be that machines can't do cognitive things. Now they can. The, um, I can't, I'm out of time, but let me just give you one story about this. So there was a recently a, a, a machine, an AI, which beat the world's best player of Go, which is an Asian version of chess, which is more complicated than chess. And uh, you know how that computer, that AI learned to play Go? They showed it 10,000 games, which were good games, taught it the rules. It created versions of itself that played itself for six months and learned from that experience how to beat the world's best player who'd been playing for 30 years. That's a scary thought when you think about human resources, uh, university admissions, Grading exams, let's hope it does grading exams, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But it will allow the great convergence to spread to more poor countries. Because right now, this is all about manufacturing. And really, it's not global. It's things that are nearby. And it's quite limited. Whereas this will allow the billion people in Africa, especially since the language won't be a barrier, to participate in the service economy in Europe very rapidly. And that will allow them to continue to grow, probably keep the commodity super cycle going. The last point is when you think about what you should tell your children to learn, uh, remember this is a different arbitrage. And up till now, the arbitrage on goods skills was one of the most reliable shields to both globalization and automation. Because face to face was very expensive and that provided the shield from foreign competition. And human cognition was irreproducible by machines before, so that protected that. So the, the idea was always more skills. 
And I think what you're going to have to do now is unpack skills. Skills that involve pattern recognition will not be good jobs, but skills that involve more human or soft skills may be good jobs. Or another way to think about it is think about what robots and AI can't do, and then that's where you should be moving to avoid direct competition. OK, conjectures for the future. That's, you know, I hope you like that one. That's what I looked like before I lost my hair. Um, so now I'm really gazing into the future. Uh, it's, not, um, you know, it's, 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 it's not solid, but here it is. Conjectures on the outlook for globalization. The arbitrage of know-how will continue since the know-how to labor ratios are still very uneven. If you think of globalization as arbitrage, if it's going to continue, you have to see, are there still arbitrage opportunities? And if you look at how the knowledge per labor is in Germany and how it is in Africa, there are lots of arbitrage opportunities left. Arbitrage of labor is just beginning, and the wage rates are very uneven, and somebody will make a very large amount of money arbitraging between the price of an economics professor in the Philippines and an economics professor in Switzerland. Moreover, uh, the ones that get replaced may very well be the high-skilled first, because you'll be saving $5,000 per month, and that will pay for an awful lot of telecommunication kit. Whereas the low-skilled workers, the difference may only be a few hundred dollars, so they may not get replaced first. Lastly, my guess is we'll have a neo-Luddite backlash by people who never really experienced globalization in the workplace. They're going to find globalization, and they're not going to blame immigrants. They're going to blame AI. So I suspect we'll have uncontrolled regulatory reactions trying to stop this related to health, safety, environment, and privacy standards, where, for example, the robots will be advancing, they'll come up with some crazy regulation to shut it down. So that's what I think for the future. So it's a sunrise, but we're in for a rough ride. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.